Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, the climate guy setting the record straight about climate. This video is titled, The Climate Control Knob. The consensus of climate experts tell us that atmospheric CO2 is the principal control knob governing Earth's climate. Science Magazine, October 14, 2010. Not to use an overly technical term here, but there's a neat paper in this week's science that explains why carbon dioxide is the main agent behind changes in the Earth's climate now and in the geologic past. And here's the paper. It was written by NASA's top climate scientists, Lasa, Schmidt, Rind, and Rudy. And we're constantly bombarded with images like this purportedly showing CO2 pouring out of smokestacks and polluting our atmosphere. This seems a bit odd because when humans exhale, they exhale carbon dioxide at 100 times the level they breathed it in. And you can't usually see people's breath. These images are very deceptive because what you're actually seeing is condensed water vapor, which are clouds, and the black is just shadows underneath the clouds, just like you see in regular clouds. Carbon dioxide is actually completely invisible, but a common trick which climate alarmists do is they Photoshop in black like this to make it look like CO2 is a dirty black carbon pollutant. In fact, carbon dioxide is an essential gas without which life itself cannot exist. Green plants absorb sunlight, carbon dioxide from the air, and water coming up from the soil in order to grow. The process of photosynthesis makes life possible. Given that CO2 is essential for all life on Earth, it seems a bit odd that people are vilifying it like this. And they want you to believe that there's been a huge increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because of humans burning fossil fuels. Well, let's put that in perspective. Over the last century, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have increased by one part per 10,000. A one part per 10,000 increase in atmospheric CO2 is equivalent to packing two extra people into Madison Square Garden. I guess it's that person right there and that person right there. Two extra people in Madison Square Garden doesn't seem like a very big change, and they want you to believe that that controls the climate. But one thing we do know for sure about the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is that it's making the Earth greener. This article is from NASA. This image shows the change in leaf area across the globe from 1982 to 2015. Earth is getting greener because more carbon dioxide makes the plants grow faster, and it also makes them more drought resistant. Green plants are a natural air conditioner. As they evaporate water, they cool the air around them. And we can see the effects of this greening here in the United States. Our summers are getting much cooler. The frequency of 90 degree days in the United States has plummeted over the last century. In 1936, almost half of summer days were over 90 degrees, and last summer was only about 25%, so it's down 50% from 1936. And the average summer maximum temperature has also plummeted over the last century. Once again, this is largely due to the greening of the Earth. This reduction in summer maximum temperatures is the exact opposite of what climate scientists claim is happening. U.S. faces dramatic rise in extreme heat, humidity, climate central, 95 degree days, how extreme heat could spread across the world, New York Times. This is all junk science. Summers used to be much hotter. In the 1930s, it was so hot in Oklahoma that half the people in the state fled and moved to California. Steinbeck wrote about this poignantly in his novel, The Grapes of Wrath. And the heat was so bad in July 1936 that 12,000 people died in 86 cities across the U.S. in just one week. So let's look and see if carbon dioxide really is the control knob for the climate. These graphs are from the 1990 U.N. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. And what these graphs show us is that Earth was much hotter 900 years ago than it is now. Back then, Vikings were farming Greenland. And English wines were competitive with French wines. And if we go back even further, we can see that Earth was even warmer 6,000 years ago than it was 1,000 years ago. So basically, as carbon dioxide has increased over time, temperatures have gone down. That doesn't sound much like a control knob. So what actually is controlling Earth's climate? One possibility is that the sun controls Earth's climate. On the right side are the UN graphs I was just showing you, and they show that Earth was very cold around the year 1600. The graph on the left shows 400 years of sunspot observations going back to the year 1600. The y-axis is the sunspot count. 
As you can see, this cold period around the year 1600 corresponded to a time of very low sunspot counts. In fact, there were almost no sunspots during the second half of the 17th century. Then as sunspots increased, Earth's temperature went up correspondingly. You can also see in this graph the 11-year sunspot cycle, where sunspots go down, go up, go down. Every 11 years, the cycle repeats itself. But if we look closely at the graph, we can see that during this very cold period during the 17th century called the Little Ice Age, the sunspot cycle disappeared. So could the sun possibly have anything to do with influencing the Earth's weather and climate? Well, the first director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder, Colorado, Walter R. Roberts, believed so. Dr. Roberts was a brilliant solar physicist. He predicted in 1973 an upcoming drought. Dr. Walter R. Roberts, a research scientist who believes sunspots directly affect the weather on Earth, says a severe drought rivaling the Dust Bowl days of the Depression may hit the Great Plains next year or by 1975. Roberts, president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, said yesterday an upcoming period of very little sunspot activity may signal an oncoming drought. So how did Dr. Roberts' forecast do? Well, he was spot on. The worst drought on record hit the western U.S. and the ski season of 1976-1977 was the worst in Colorado's history. President Ford went to Colorado to ski that Christmas and there was no snow. So how did Dr. Roberts make this correct prediction? Well, in 1951, he figured this out. Great solar flares, streams of gas which are shot from the face of the sun far into space at velocities as high as 200 miles a second, tend to be followed two days later by depressions or elevations of atmospheric pressure on Earth. This new finding of Sun-Earth relations by observers at the Harvard University Observatory at Climax, Colorado, was announced by Dr. Walter R. Roberts at the annual Arthur Lecture of the Smithsonian Institution. It would be a pretty safe bet that 97% of current climate scientists don't even know about this. Their education was centered around carbon dioxide propaganda, and they didn't really learn anything else. In 1976, National Geographic reported that Alaska's ice masses advance and retreat in direct correlation with the cyclic changes in sunspot numbers. Well, that isn't what we hear now. Scientists now say that the retreat of glaciers is due to carbon dioxide. Well, let's look at which theory makes sense. Alaska's most famous glacier, Glacier Bay, had retreated 48 miles before John Muir first saw it in 1879. Well, according to the sunspot theory, that makes sense. Earth was coming out of the Little Ice Age around that time. So Glacier Bay retreated 48 miles from 1794 to 1879, but there was very little increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide during that period. So the sunspot theory for the retreat of glaciers and coming out of the Little Ice Age makes sense, but the carbon dioxide theory makes no sense at all. So let's look at some other research. As early as 1801, British astronomer William Herschel suggested a link between sunspot counts and wheat prices. This was confirmed again recently. Two researchers in Israel found a statistical link between the activity of the sun and the price of wheat in 17th century England. This correlation between sunspots and grain prices was a common theme among scientists during the 19th century. Professor Jevons boldly expressed his opinion that sunspots control Earth's magnetism, rainfall, atmospheric pressure, and the like. This is very similar to what Dr. Roberts believed at NCAR in 1976. In 1931, the New York Times reported that there is some relation between sunspots and our weather has long been suspected by meteorologists. Now they're certain. That sounds a lot like a consensus to me. December 12, 1932. A time when scientists will be able to glance up at the sunspots and predict climate changes for the benefit of farmers and commercial interests is the forecast at the annual exhibition of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. An indication of this possibility was seen in evidence that sunspots have been affecting the Earth's climate for millions of years in waxing and waning cycles of between 11 and 12 years in length, exhibited by Dr. A. E. Douglas and Dr. Waldo S. Glock. Climate cycles reflected in the thickness of tree growth rings and annual deposits of clay and mud by streams correspond closely with sunspot cycles far into the past, they showed. Douglas is still the most famous tree ring researcher. 
And at the 1936 Congress of the Mediterranean Medical Society, it was reported that experts could predict all kinds of catastrophes based on sunspots. So what's going on with the sun now? On the left is a picture I took yesterday. There's no sunspots, just like there was in the second half of the 17th century. I took the picture on the right last September during those huge forest fires in the Pacific Northwest. There was so much smoke in the air that you could actually see the sunspots without any filter on your camera. So there's been a sharp drop off in sunspot activity and some experts believe that we're headed into a long period of very low activity just like the second half of the 17th century when earth was extremely cold. So do we see any evidence that the solar minimum is having an impact on temperatures? It's quite possible that we are. I just spent the last two months out in Philadelphia where they're having one of their coldest springs on record. And in the Midwest, they are having their coldest spring on record. Temperatures in the Midwest this spring have been an incredible 16 degrees cooler than they were back in 1910 when carbon dioxide levels were much lower in the atmosphere. And the frequency of warm days in the Midwest has been by far the lowest on record this year. So which theory seems more credible? that this giant hot ball in the sky controls Earth climate, or the two extra people packed into Madison Square Garden are what's controlling our weather. I don't find the carbon dioxide controlling the climate theory very credible, and the people promoting it are difficult to take seriously. So what are climate alarmists doing wrong? Let's take a look at that now. Back up at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, where Walter R. Roberts did his research in the 1970s, we see this exhibit. There's nothing in their museum about sunspots anymore. Dr. Robert's legacy has been lost. But they do have lots of propaganda about carbon dioxide and temperature going hand in hand. In this graph, in the blue line, they show atmospheric carbon dioxide going back 800,000 years. And the red line shows temperature going back 800,000 years. These graphs were made from Antarctic ice cores. And once again, the blue line shows carbon dioxide concentration in the ice, and the red line shows temperature. They track each other very closely until recently when we have a big spike in CO2 and no corresponding temperature spike. So this doesn't make sense if CO2 is driving the temperature. Temperature should have gone up with CO2, but it didn't. So what's going on here? Well, it's a classic problem of putting the cart before the horse. CO2 doesn't drive temperature. Temperature has always driven CO2 in the historical record. What this red line shows is ice age cycles going back 800,000 years. Very large periods of warming, 10 degrees centigrade between the bottom of the ice age and the peak of the interglacial maximums. Geologists have known for well over a century that as oceans warm up, they outgas carbon dioxide. This is because the solubility of carbon dioxide is lower in warm water. Anyone who's ever opened up a warm beer or soda is familiar with this concept. You get a lot of CO2 coming out of a warm beer when you pop the top. So over the last century, we've seen a big CO2 spike, but no corresponding temperature spike. Well, let's put the horse back in front of the cart and recognize that temperature controls CO2, not the other way around. The problem is that climate scientists are generally unfamiliar with these basic concepts of chemistry and physics, which geologists learn in their first semester of college. The whole global warming scam is based around a fundamental misinterpretation of the relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. They've got it exactly backwards. There's nothing new about this. If we go back a century ago, astronomers were convinced that there were canals on Mars. In the late 19th century, Percival Lowell made some misinterpretations of what he was seeing through his telescope. He thought he was seeing straight lines. He developed this very elaborate theory that these lines were canals built by Martians. And by 1919, the fact that the Martian canals exist is no longer doubted even by the most religious astronomer. No one doubts today that these canals are parts of an enormous irrigation system which supplies water to the desert inlands. When science is based around a misinterpretation or incorrect observation, the entire field of science can go off in the weeds. That's what happened with astronomers a hundred years ago, and that's exactly what's going on with climate science today. It's based on a fundamental misinterpretation of the relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. They have it exactly backwards. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science for a long time.